Today, we are lucky enough to be sitting here with Greg Godovitz. For those of you who don't know who he is, he's a legendary musician and author, a uh, member of Flood with uh, SoCan uh, Hall of Fame and Duck D songs, Cousin Mary, Brother and Me and Turn 21, also a member of Gatto and a recent, proje recent project, The Great Godovitz Coalition. Uh, and we're actually talking about your new book, Up Close and Uncomfortable. Right there, there. it is right there, Dylan. I just happened to have it on the table here. Talk about handy dandy. <laughs> um, so Greg, first off, what is your book about? Well, it was actually part two of this book, uh, Travels with My Aunt, which I released in uh, 2011. Uh, this is the first 20 years of my career from 1964 to 1984. And then I started writing part two of Travels and I thought, you know, this is exactly the same as the first book. It's boring for me to write it. So for the new book, I decided to go further afield and write short stories about music, but also about other parts. Because in, in my first book, there was nothing about my childhood. And mm. I usually hate that in rock biographies, but my childhood was as nuts as my adult life. So I decided to add some stories and sort of drift in and out of time. There's no finite uh, timeline in the new book. It goes from when I was 11 to when I'm 69, which I am now. So it's all over the place. And the stories just aren't about music. There's stories about aliens. There's stories about Elvis. Uh, there's stories about me meeting Ringo Starr. Uh, it's all over the map, but they tell me it's extremely funny. So I'm happy to hear that. Uh, yeah, actually, I was reading some quotes and some different things just going through your bio and all the stuff that um, uh, your PR guy sent me. And I'll tell you, um, it's had amazing reviews. I've only got to see sort of the Cliff's Notes uh, version so far because I haven't uh, got my copy in yet, but I'm excited to read it. And I think that some of these old stories, um, it's important to, you know, sort of track not only the history of music, but the history of where our music comes from. Yeah, well, I've been doing this since 1964. So that's 57 years now. And uh, I mean, if somebody had told me, well, first of all, if somebody had told me the Beatles were gonna be as relevant today as they were 57 years ago, I, everybody would have said, yeah, sure. But that's the case. I mean, we just happened to pick the right business to be in. The unfortunate thing now, of course, with the pandemic being what it is, the music business is on hold. And mm -hmm. that, that's a tragedy. I mean, there's a lot of musicians out there and people in the industry, technicians, uh, even the people that pour the beer in the clubs, everybody's out of a job, you know I mean? So we got to really hope that we can, you know, wear the masks, wash our hands a lot and let's get over this thing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I know personally myself, uh, life hasn't been the same since March of uh, 2020. And I know a lot of other people with venues. I've lost clubs that are, you know, very oh, close yeah. to me and that gave me a home when I was first starting out and nobody would talk to me, you know, and, uh, and two of them are not here anymore. And it, it's definitely been hard. But I also think that finding ways to keep, uh, you know, busy like you have with your book and, you know, for artists to shoot music videos yeah. and to use this time recording. Like I have this saying that I've been telling bands that I work with, don't waste COVID. Like, yeah. you know, make use of the time the best you can so that when it's time to come back, you can come back and hit it hard. Yeah, well, fortunately for me, I started writing the third book. Uh, I realized when I finished this one here that there was nothing in it about my eight years living in Calgary. Mm. and visiting Edmonton, where you are. That's right. Uh, and then my five years coming back to Toronto and putting a new band together and stuff, I had nothing about that in the second book. So I quickly realized that what I was going to write was another part three, the the end story of my life, you know. And uh, I'm, I'm actually, I've got a title for it. I've been writing it slowly but surely. I think I, sh I should be able to have it finished this year. Uh, I'm going to call it The Idiots Trilogy Part Four. Oh, I so, like it. <laughs> I've always had a way with the, the titles of both of these books, Travels with My Amp and Up Close and Uncomfortable. And then there'll be the Idiots Trilogy, that's me, mm. part four. So that's coming next. Yeah, something unrelated. The reason I found your um, Travels with My Amp so uh, such an uh, interesting name, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the book. It was written by a, name, a man named Robert Leckie, and it's called um, Helmet for My Pillow. 
and it's about the guys in the South Pacific. And I kind of thought, geez, that seems like a funny way of having a serious name that's not serious for a book. I, I like oh. the travels with my aunt. Just, I don't know. It reminded me of that somehow. And I said, geez, that sounds serious, but I don't think it is. <laughs> well, you, no, no, you're right on the money. Uh, actually, it was, a mo- it was a book first by a fellow named Graham Greene. Mm. And then in 1972, I went to see the movie adaptation of it called Travels with My Aunt. Oh. So I remember looking at my girlfriend at the time and I said, you know, if I ever write a book, I'm going to call it Travels with My Aunt. And of course, 30 years later, I did. But that's where it came from. Uh, Graham Greene, famous, uh, famous author. Uh, I've never read the book, but I saw the movie and it was very, very funny. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. I've never read the book or uh, or seen the movie, but I like that there's a, a um, you know, that's the history behind it. Um, tell me, how long roughly do you figure it took you to write this book? The, the second installment, of course, the, the second book. Yeah, the second book took quite a while. Um, I meant I was I was intending the book to be humorous. Mm. And Travels with My Aunt, the first book is funny inadvertently. It's just because of the scenarios that I describe and the people that were in the music business, they're characters and they came off funny. In the second book, I wrote it intentionally to be funny. And so I would, you know, it took six years to write it because I would wake up in the morning, I'd read what I wrote and I go, this isn't funny. And I'd have to start again until it was funny. And now people are saying, Whatever you do, if you're reading these books, don't read them in bed with your spouse because they're going to whack you and go stop laughing. So mission accomplished. And, and what better during these horrible times that we're living through than a good laugh? You know, so mission accomplished. You know, I, I set out to write a humor book and I've written two of them. Well, and I think that, you know, they're real stories, obviously. These are real things that have yeah. happened in your life through your travels as a child or, you know, all the different scenarios are real but you found a way to be comical, um, you know, in your second book. And I think music attracts some unique characters to begin with. So totally. you end up with a lot of funny stories anytime you start. That one time I was at this show usually starts out with some sort of, uh, you know, there's something pretty funny after that. Definitely. Um, well, some- you know, I, I, I have a story in my book called Aliens E.T. Moi. So Aliens and Me. Mm. I, I have seen more UFOs than any human being I know. I don't know, they follow me around. But I actually sat beside one on a plane once. <laughs> and I know people people that have seen me talk about it, they go, this guy is crazy. But, you know, I was on a plane. I had my son. He was very young with me. And there was this little guy sitting at the window. He didn't look at us. We didn't look at him. I got my son settled. We get up to cruising altitude. The lights go down. This guy turns to me. I still didn't look at him. And he says, do you know what a Foo Fighter is? Now, this is 30 years before the Foo Fighter band. So I said, yeah, I know exactly what it is. And uh, I'm not going to put you on the spot because not everybody knows what it is, but Mm. this is where Dave Grohl got the name for his band. Foo Fighters were balls of light that during the dog fights over the English Channel, these balls of light would come flying in while these guys were machine gunning each other. Mm -hmm. These UFOs would fly in amongst the the fighter planes, the, you know, the World War II fighter planes. And the Germans thought it was the Russians. The Russians thought it was the British. The British thought it was the Americans. Uh, somebody thought it was us, the Canadians. The Americans coined the frame, phrase Foo, Foo Fighters. So this guy out of the blue says, do you know what a Foo Fighter is? And I'm, I'm talking to him and telling him about seeing them over the pyramids and all the times I've seen incredible UFOs. And I look down and I see his, le- his hand is on his left leg and his fingers are twice as long as what they should be. And I'm look, I'm staring at the guy's hand and he was basically showing me what he really was. And I know that sounds crazy, but it happened. And then he he turned around, I turned around and looked him in the face for the first time. And I don't remember what he looked like. I passed out instantly and forgot about the whole thing for 20 odd years. It just came back into my head. And when I remember that, so that story, and, and it's an interesting story, because but most of the people that were reading it, they're going to go, this guy's nuts. But I'm not. I saw it. <laughs> yeah, well, it, you know, there's, as time goes on, things that used to be not as uh, not believable are far more believable in a, in a modern time or with a different perspective. And I think that uh, if nothing else, if, it's, if a story makes somebody go, huh, I think you've, uh, you know, accomplished in that, particularly because it's a series of small stories effectively, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, for uh, sure. 
you know, and I kind of like that because I don't have the attention span, I don't think, to read an entire novel uh, with one story. I'd lose my track, a uh, uh, train of thought and have to move on. Most people are like that. And I think the biggest compliment I get for people is that the book is so, both of my books are so anecdotal that, you know, I said, well, they're the perfect bathroom companion. You can go in there, read a chapter in five minutes, Mm -hmm. and leave it in there you know well i was actually going to get the new book printed on a roll of toilet paper oh there you go i think i might do the next one like that well have a have a collector's edition that comes with a roll of toilet paper and each one has a, a little greg uh, bit of wisdom so tell me i there's a thing in your bio i i can't remember it verbatim but it was something to the effect you know you've met one beetle two you know members of kiss or something to that effect Tell me, what is in your mind, what was your, you know, person that you met that was your, uh, a humbling moment, we'll say. Who's a person well, that was a humbling moment, in your opinion, as far as, you know, wow, I'm meeting this guy. Well, I, the funny thing is I never humbled by that. You know, I mean, I've met everybody. <laughs> they're, they're just, what I've found is if you treat these guys like normal human beings, they will treat you like a normal human being. So when I, when I met Paul McCartney, I walked into his dressing room it was like seeing a cousin standing there. Mm -hmm. He's such a big part of my life. And we talked for a half an hour. We, but, you know, we, I didn't mention the Beatles to him, which he, I'm sure he's sick of hearing about. We talked about baseball. I said, you know, in this stadium, this is where the Blue Jays play. And he says, I've never been to a baseball game. And then shortly thereafter, I see him starting to go to New York Yankees games when he's in New York. And I thought, I wonder if I put the bug in this guy's ear. Same when I met Ringo Starr. I mean, it, like he was just a normal guy, except for the fact that when I left there, I went, dear Lord, I've now met two of the most famous human beings in the history of the world, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and Kiss, I played, we played a, a number of dates with Kiss. Uh, when I was in Flood, we played the first two Toronto dates that Kiss ever played in Canada. Oh, we, really? We did one at a university in Kitchener, and then we did one at the Victory Burlesque in Toronto. And once again, you know, like we're in the opening band. We're not looking for autographs. I didn't even know who they were. Uh, it was a very stripped backstage for them. They had a couple of candelabras uh, for scenery mm -hmm. with candles going, black candles. And, and Gene, of course, did his fire breathing and his blood out of the mouth thing. But it was their image that you looked at and you went, these guys are going to be a big band, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I met a few of the Rolling Stones, met Bruce Springsteen. There's a whole list of people. I have a story uh, in, in the new book called Why My Hero Should Not Meet Me. And uh, something always seems to go wrong. And the, it's like a full page of people that you know. And I've had, uh, I've had the you know, great fortune of meeting and hanging out with all of these guys. Yeah, I think for me, it's a thing of, uh, I always say humbling and not, you know, starstruck. I don't think I could be a band manager or promoter. If I got starstruck, I would have a hell of a time doing my job. Exactly. But I do, um, and not just in music and everything, I try to respect the journey, for lack of a better term. So to meet somebody, oh, yeah, even totally, yeah. you know, even uh, chatting with somebody like you, I mean, 57 years in the business, I mean, that's my lifetime plus, you know, 80%. Um, so I can't, I don't even know that I, I would live long enough to get that many years in. So it's, it's a humbling thing that you would take the time to chat with me in the sense that I respect the journey of, you know, 57 plus years, pushing 60 years of music, knowledge, experience, gigging, touring, you know, and, and when it was a lot harder to gig and tour, I, I would say, you know, probably arguably when, you know, oh, maybe yeah, it's, it's been a long journey. There's no doubt about it, but I look at everybody the same way, man. I don't, I don't feel like I'm any different or any better than anybody else. I just happen to have somebody put the gift of music in my, in my head and mm -hmm. I'm able, you know, to write songs. And now to be able to write prose and newspaper articles and whatever it is else I'm creatively doing. I don't know where it comes from. I think it just, it appears out of thin air for me. Yeah. You know, I just, I'll be driving along in my car and a whole song, it just appears in my head. It's like somebody is telegraphing them down to me, you know? Yeah. Which I, could explain those aliens. <laughs> it could be. Well, and I've heard that too from artists a lot of times. They're just, I'm like, where did you get the idea for this? They're like, I really don't know. I was sitting around playing with Don't my guitar know, yeah. in my room and all of a sudden here it is. 
um, you know, yeah, or whatever the true. case may be. It's just here it is. And I've always just kind of respected that. And um, just um, on the topic of music, I know we're talking about your book, but you do have an album out from 2019. I believe it's called Amuse Me from the Greg Godovitz Coalition. No, it's not Coalition. This I did this album. Let's see if I can get this without it sh shimmering here. Impossible. There we go. Mm. It's called Amuse Me. Uh, I recorded the album in Calgary when I lived there mm. uh, with Paul D from Loverboy. That's correct. Yeah. And uh, Paul, Paul and I were putting a band together because uh, he was living there and we've been friends forever. Uh, we started uh, jamming at a place called uh, the Blue the Blues Can. Uh, okay. It's sort of like your blues on white. It's that sort of idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would jam there every Sunday. And then we started throwing in original songs that I was writing and Paul had some new stuff. And he said, I'm moving to Vancouver uh, in about six months. But before I go, we have to record these new songs that you've written. And, uh, and we did. And, and I used the cream of the crop of musicians in, uh, in Calgary. Uh, Mike Little plays with Gord Bamford's band, played B3 organ. Uh, Mike Clark, it has Mikey's juke joint, play, was one of the saxophone players on it. Paul Dean played guitar on it. I mean, it, it was an incredible lineup of musicians. And these were all brand new songs that I wrote in one year. I hadn't written a song in 10 years. And all of a sudden I wrote 25 songs uh, in one year. It was just weird. Well, I, I think that, you know, maybe uh, I, I think with everybody, you know, as you get older, do you find that you like want to expand more? You know, you want to leave less rocks unturned maybe? Is that something that, you know, with writing books and stuff? I mean, because 2011 was your first book, if I'm not mistaken. The yeah. travels with my aunt so yeah. obviously that's you're still 50 years into your music career so is it do you think it's like uh you want to leave your your wisdom behind or you're just you you say you know what i'm I, i'm at this point in my career and i just want to do everything i want to do well you know somebody asked me recently are you thinking about do you ever think about retiring and i go it doesn't even enter my mind i'm just getting started as far as i'm concerned you know i, I want to write a musical Mm. I think I'm going to wait until uh, I finish the new book. And then probably next year, I want to sit down. I've had an idea for a musical in my head for many years. And as long as people keep, you know, enjoying the product, whether it's what I write or what I record, I don't see any reason to stop uh, creating, you know. Uh, I also dug up in my computer, I started working on a children's book many many years ago my daughter uh, jasmine had a a pet uh, she had a a teddy bear that she named choby and uh i started writing a story about the little bear that couldn't talk but he could do everything else so he can fly and all this stuff and then he finds a stick in the in the forest that can talk for him and okay. i'm i'm going to flesh it out and get it illustrated and i'm, I'm going to finish a children's novel just, just for the sake of writing it, you know, as long as somebody enjoys it and get, gets a laugh out of it or they can entertain their children with it, why not, you know? No, I, listen, I think that's great. I have a very, when people ask me what I do for a living, I say I'm a general contractor in music. And that's basically because if you ask me to do it, if it sounds interesting, I'll be like, well, I've never done that before, but we'll take it, a, you know, give glory a go. <laughs> and I think that, you know, personally, I don't want to, I left a long career in construction to come into music and I've never felt more at home, I mm -hmm. guess we'll say. And Good. so and so that's why, you know, these interviews, these things um, are very, you know, important and powerful, not just to the people that watch them, but, you know, to myself too, you know, the experience I gained. So that being said, I always ask this of everybody that I interview. If you could tell one piece of wisdom to a new musician or artist starting out, what's your, what's your one piece of wisdom? Don't let any, don't let anybody else deal with your money. <laughs> look after your own money and it'll look after you, you know? Yeah. Um, so we touched on a lot of your music career, on a lot of your books and everything. Um, no plan on slowing down at all no. by the sounds of things. Um, I hope you don't slow down because uh, to be completely honest, when I heard about this interview, is when I learned about a lot of this stuff, your music and your books, and now I want more. 
So hopefully I can continue to get more for uh, some years to come. Well, I hope uh, you enjoy the, when you get travels, I hope you enjoy it. And now you've got, you've, I guess you have a PDF copy of the new one that Eric sent you, right? Yes, I do. Yes, yeah, I so, do have a copy. Yeah, I would read travels first if I were you. And then, and by the way, uh, for the folks that are listening or watching, uh, the, both of my books are available on uh, Amazon Kindle. I guess you, you could put up a uh, shop Greg Godovich thing later and they can find them, right? Yes, absolutely. All your links to all your pages, everything uh, that Eric yeah. was kind enough to send me, uh, minus the PDF of the book, um, will be uh, listed up on the, uh, on the link for Spotlight Sessions. Um, and is there anybody... I know after 57 years, this is a hard question. Is there anybody that you'd like to thank that maybe supported you in your endeavors uh, or, you know, somebody that just, you know, was always somebody special to you that maybe deserves a little shout out? Well, besides uh, my daughter, Jasmine, and my gal, uh, who I call Mrs. Claypool, who look after my business interests, them I let handle my money because them I trust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... Uh, I want to thank everybody that's ever come to see, whether it's Gatto or Flood or whatever band I've been playing in. I've never had to work a real job. I've had, you know, I, I've said the same thing for since I started playing. When we get paid at the end of the night, I go, we actually get paid for doing this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like the most fun business. It can be the most fun business in the, in the world. It also has its downside as well. But you know what? At the end of the day, I just, I can't think of anything else I'd rather do than making music for people, you know? Well, I think if, you know, the saying does ring true, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life, that sort That's, of thing. Exactly. And uh, like I said, when I switched over to music, even though I'm pretty green, I, I don't see, I couldn't see myself doing anything else now. It just fit all of a sudden. And I, I really love it. Um, Thank you again, Greg, so much. I won't take up too much of your time. My pleasure, man. And uh, Spotlight Sessions, catch Greg, all of his links. We'll tell you where to find it, uh, up close and uncomfortable. Thank you very much, okay. everybody. And everybody, wear your mask and wash your hands a lot. Let's see you safe next time we come out on tour. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you.